Wow, thanks. Great, great. Uh, thanks for the um, introduction, uh, Marisa. And I'll uh, step in with the topic that I've got for today. Thanks everyone for coming to the session. I already see around 50 people in the crowd already. So hopefully what you'll learn today is gonna be uh, useful and beneficial for you. So today we'll be digging into the DevOps world with the focus on velocity of DevOps teams and how to achieve um, that using GitOps and other practices. Before we jump into the presentation, a few words on uh, myself. I've been doing software engineering since, since I was a kid. And for the last five years, I've been doing a lot of distributed systems uh, and distributed teams. Most of the technical leadership roles uh, and dealing with Kubernetes. And recently I joined uh, Portainer as a developer advocate. So now I'll be more focusing on uh, helping other people succeed with the technology rather than um, being the one in the field. Uh, you can uh, find me on Twitter. My nickname is um, in the end of the slide. And uh, I'd be happy to chat and answer all of the questions that you've got. E either that would be the distributed systems or Kubernetes or Portainer um, or my uh, awesome dog. So uh, feel free to um, connect on the social networks. Um, and um, as an additional bullet point to that, I should have stated that I'm very practical. Uh, I'm a very practical developer, so I always start with the problem I'm trying to solve, and then eventually I figure out the solution. So that is the exact way, the pattern that we are going to follow today in our session. First, we would uh, identify the problem, then uh, what are the patterns to resolve that problem, how other people do that, and then we would cover the tools that uh, we got to use to resolve that problem, which basically implementing the patterns, but with the more practical uh, way. Uh, first, uh, to get everyone on the same page, um, I will just describe you a very classical CI CD pipeline in Cube, and not only, that I've encountered uh, multiple times when I did the consulting part. Uh, so you have one possibly gigantic pipeline, which takes care of uh, fetching the code, building, testing, producing some artifact out of a successful build, deploys that artifact straight away uh, to the selected environment. And then you go onto the environment you, and see what happens there. Maybe you click a few pages, do a smoke test, or best case, run some automation tests on top of that. While it really sounds simple, it's very complicated and um, suboptimal to me, it seems. And um, why? Uh, I definitely see a lot of problems here. So I'll be going over them. If you ever encountered uh, these problems, uh, just raise your hands. I think you should be able to do that in, uh, um, in Zoom. So first one uh, is um, the problem of what is in, in production now. Imagine two guys uh, pushing the code at the same time. To developers and how do we then figure out what is on front now if your pipeline uh, triggers and merge to a particular branch such as master or main. Mm. The next one is the um, exposing the access uh, to the cluster by allowing people to do the routine work with cluster resources such as deploying uh, things, applications. Um, I see that um, a very error prone approach and it tends to make a lot of mistakes. So simply giving any of your peers admin access to the cluster is not a good idea. And everyone is an admin is a very bad idea, especially just for deploying the application. Uh, next on, um, sometimes it happens that cluster is kind of, is exploding. So I'm sure that you've uh, uh, come across um, that scenario of uh, what we have to do if we have to recreate the cluster, either that would be moving to another subscription or recreating all the applications that we had. In classical CI CD pipelines, you would run simply all of the pipelines for each service, and that would take a lot of uh, much of the time. Um, and the rollback is rebuilt in classical CI CD pipelines. I've encountered uh, multiple products 
uh, with the build time up to a few hours. Um, to me, it seems horrible since it kills the feedback loop and the whole idea of moving quickly and being able to break things, then roll it back and uh, see the see what happens. So uh, what we're gonna have a look at today uh, are the patterns uh, to resolve these issues. And the uh, first one uh, is uh, decoupling uh, CI from CD. So decoupling your continuous integration from your continuous delivery and deployment. Essentially, that's the, the exact enabler to GitOps. And GitOps could be considered as a part of DevOps culture, uh, uh, one of the practices. And DevOps culture is something which is a state of art and state when uh, you are having everything automated and uh, the team is doing great uh, with the delivery. So uh, we'll get into all of these patterns as we go along. And um, I think it would be extremely useful. First one is uh, uh, decoupling CI from CD. It's kind of breaking up and not breaking up at the same time. Uh, like we are decomposing the process. So independent components are able to take over some step in our process. So uh, the same good old classic uh, CI CD pipeline. And then we are putting that uh, um, that build, test, and release into one piece. And this is the leftover of uh, our old good gigantic pipeline. And now we are adding another um, option to have the deployment being done uh, through some other component. So that's what we're exactly trying to separate here. As we... Um, now have it decoupled. It enables us to plug in that independent and external component. So you'll see what it gives us um, in a second. It gives us the ability to implement the um, approach of GitOps, of keeping the desired state in cluster based on the repo. Uh, there are a lot of really excellent talks uh, out there on GitOps. I'll include them in the, uh, in the materials that I'll send out. But general overview of the concept is uh, such as I've described. Uh, so if the Git repo gets a change, Luster should also change its state. And by state, I mean the applications deployed, services, load balancers, et cetera. What we have here is like the, the whole idea of GitOps is um, Kubernetes uh, manifests are just sitting down in your Git repo. And uh, now it uh, enables us to rapidly collaborate on that. It's much easier and addresses the problem of uh, uh, not knowing what is in production environment now and uh, enables uh, the exact uh, source of truth. So you, you are able to have a look at that and figure it out. Um, and it's Git based, which means that you have uh, all of the uh, pull requests, reviews, branching, rollbacks, uh, signature, and uh, most importantly, what it does, it keeps the um, history of commits. So it's much more deterministic than uh, kubectl commands being run on the cluster or even CI tool or running these uh, commands manually. So yeah, pretty much uh, that's it. And it also enables us uh, to better understand what's happening with the shared resources, um, such as uh, shared load balancers, shared volumes, etc. Because it, it essentially uh, has the Git uh, heritage to that. Uh, I'll walk you through the um, diagram how, how that works. Initially, imagine we have a developer who did emerge into the main branch. And CI tool on the left uh, picks it up and does exactly what we described before building, testing, pushing the image to the container registry. And um, once that's done, our developer is able to go inside that GitOps repo and change the image version on his application, just bumping that by one or something like that. So, GitOps tool 
which is um, running inside of the Kubernetes cluster, uh, will pick it up, pick up the changes from the repo and start applying that. And it's only the job of that GitOps tool to listen uh, to the changes happening in GitOps cluster, continuously pulling that uh, in, in GitOps repo uh, part and uh, applying that onto the Kubernetes API, which is declarative by itself. So what's happening is we are pulling uh, YAMLs out of GitOps repo and applying that onto Kubernetes. And great, now it's uh, whole uh, state of cluster has changed as we just uh, changed uh, something in the GitOps repo. And uh, important thing to notice here is that that GitOps tool has to live within your Kubernetes cluster to be able to apply such changes and for that to be secured. And next thing, as we tackle the general concept, um, Let's see what kind of tools have we got here. Um, the first two are big, big players in GitOps uh, space. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that. Uh, they are great and capable of doing a lot of uh, things such as doing the basic idea of GitOps, doing the progressive delivery, tackling the multi-tenancy, et cetera. I want to tell you about something that we've built into Portainer with the latest uh, community edition release, uh, 2.9.1. And uh, that's something that I call lightweight GitOps. I've recorded a small video on that, uh, so we would be able to um, see. That's the basic UI of Portainer. And what I have here is my local environment, which is the Docker. I run Windows and uh, I run a Windows subsystem for Linux. And I have Docker installed on that uh, subsystem. So let's go into that and see what do we got here is the list of containers that I have. It's simply container container and uh, control plane for uh, the Kubernetes cluster that I'm running uh, kind. Next off, uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to deploy the application into my uh, Docker Docker environment, and I have uh, already prepared a Docker Compose uh, file, which describes the applications that I want to deploy. So I'll just specify that in the UI, so I don't have to write any of kubectl commands or anything. It's simply uh, fetching, uh, specifying the repo, specifying where to find the changes, where to listen to, ch to the changes. Um, and I'll also set the uh, uh, fetch interval to one minute. So each one minute, it will be pulling the changes uh, from the Git repo. Hitting up the deploy button and it should be deployed in a second, I think. Yep, exactly. So, and now what we see is a stack. Stack is a... Um, logical group of uh, containers deployed in my Docker environment, which are all grouped by the fact that they are in the same compose file. So what we see here is some front end, is some Redis cache and a busy box. Uh, and what I want you to have a look at is the version of Ubuntu here uh, is uh, 20.04. Uh, so what we'll just do is go into uh, my uh, git repo and uh, change that in uh, in the git repo. So as you see, it's 20 here, and I, I just wanna, uh, I feel like changing that to 18. So as you see, it's 18, it's committed. And now let's uh, wait for a sec for it to come on here. Uh, let's go into the containers uh, tab and enable auto refresh, uh, so it should be okay, I think. And eventually we'll find that Ubuntu was updated to the exact version that I've specified in the Git repo, which enables me to collaborate uh, with uh, my peers on that repo and the changes will be replicated in, the, in my local Docker environment. And that environment could be literally anything. We'll just briefly now jump uh, into the next use case, which will be more 
uh, Kubernetes related. So as I've mentioned, I have kind of uh, spend, spending up on my local machine. Same uh, UI for here. I'll just deploy another application, the same, actually the same Docker Compose file. Uh, I'll pick the Compose format. So, and the uh, Portainer will be able to translate that Docker Compose format into the Kubernetes manifest. We'll put the uh, fetch interval the same as we did before with Docker, which actually is kind of a huge enabler for any migration from Docker uh, to Kubernetes because you can use the same Docker Compose files and uh, that would be translated and deployed in the Kubernetes environment. So let's hit that deploy button now and see what happens. Uh, it will uh, take a few seconds to spin all of that uh, up. Uh, just updated the page, so it's all now happy and running. Uh, notice the version of the image, the same one as we've changed uh, in the uh, Git uh, just a minute ago. And let's now deploy also the one with uh, uh, the exact Kubernetes manifest. I also have another file in the Git repo. And that file is called uh, busybox YAML. It's a Kubernetes manifest of busybox. And uh, all of the same process. So just specify the path for the uh, resource you want to have deployed. And uh, then uh, specify the interval. In my case, it's one minute. And then hit that deploy button. So what happens now is that it, that busybox got uh, deployed or at least waiting for uh, get deployed. You can notice the version of that busy box is stable in the UI. And uh, let's now uh, modify the version of uh, uh, busy box that we've deployed from uh, Docker Compose, and then go back to the busy box uh, from the Kubernetes manifest and update the version here as well. So what now we expect is uh, that um, the changes that we just did in these two files will be uh, fetched into the uh, UI or not fetched into the UI, but fetched into our Kubernetes cluster and then reflected in the UI. So what do we have now is stable and uh, busybox stable and Ubuntu 18.04. Let's enable auto refresh here. Close that. And eventually it will get updated as we spent uh, uh, specified the uh, update interval as one minute. So let's just give it another second. Boom. Uh, so now what it says is that our busy box got updated to latest and our Ubuntu instance got updated to 2004, which is exactly what we just updated in the, um, in the Git environment which is great, which is exactly what we aimed at. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of that uh, feature is that um, having the reliable uh, workflow enabled uh, for uh, our users. So, and if you are so tired of uh, doing, the, um, doing all of the things manually and you have to collaborate anyhow with your peers, that is the great way to start. And after that, you'd be able to either uh, stay with um, Portainer in that exact feature or grow and uh, switch to uh, using Flux, switch to using Argo. Uh, doesn't really matter. What actually matters is embracing the correct uh, workflow and more reliable one. So we would uh, see less of uh, issues with the production clusters. And that is something that uh, really contributes to the DevOps culture to me, it seems like that. Um, when um, mm, what we did was decoupling that CI from CD, adding GitOps on top of that, all that contributes to the healthy DevOps culture. There's the cultural transformation in the organization, which embraces the collaboration, uh, embraces the shared control and responsibility over the particular component piece of the system. So uh, if you have a service in that Kubernetes cluster, then you own that service 
from the very initial stage to all of the monitoring, all of the uh, feedback sessions, uh, et cetera, all of the retrospectives. And um, having that um, idea of DevOps uh, makes teams very autonomous. Uh, and that's why I think they are top performers uh, because they there is no uh, throwing over the fans uh, crap in their life. They simply take care of everything they've got. Either that would be a, the development or testing or deploying the application or monitoring the application, they've got it. And that's actually quite hard uh, in pure Kubernetes environment. So that's why all the tools like uh, Argo or Flux or Protainer exist because simply it's too complicated without correct tooling. That is the part of engineering culture to equip your engineers with uh, right tools so they can um, not spend uh, endless hours figuring out the uh, Kubernetes, but can deliver the value with that uh, from day zero and uh, make that in a way that it's uh, reliable and consistent. That's the exact philosophy of uh, what we're trying to do at Portainer. That's simply why we exist. We believe that um, we can make the whole industry much easier for fellow developers and make them self-service that Kubernetes cluster. Make them make them use the workflows such as GitOps. Make these uh, available to them at no huge cost of learning Kubernetes for a, a few years. Because personally, for me, um, I did last five years with Kubernetes, and I'm still uh, so newbie in that space. Even though I've been resolving really complex issues, but sometimes it just stumbles upon me and can do nothing. So that's why uh, the tools like Portainer exist. It's supposed to be easy, but it's not at the moment. And we are the ones who try to mitigate that complexity and embrace the really reliable workflows uh, and educate our users on the topic. So let's get back to our problems. Um, let's try to address them one by one. Uh, what is on prod now? That's easily addressable by just having a look at the Git repo. And that should be the answer in 99% of the cases. If uh, uh, something is in GitOps repo, then it means that it's in Kube. I can do it manually. Just let me admin. Uh, that's also addressed because this way, you would enforce a role-based success policy, which, uh, which uh, Portainer also does. Um, you would embrace that role-based success policies and uh, only the GitOps tool will be capable of doing any changes to your uh, Kubernetes cluster. And that is much more, much more reliable. Uh, in the case of, uh, um, moving the cluster to another platform, another subscription, or just cluster exploding, uh, the recreation process would be quite simple because you would uh, uh, repoint that, deploy that GitOps tool and say, hey, fetch all of the applications from that repo to my cluster. And that would be much, much quicker than uh, running all of the pipelines and even pointing the pipelines to the correct cluster. In the case of um, rollback, what you simply need to do is um, to revert the commit. And uh, that commit, um, that updated state of Git repo, uh, will be replicated into your Kubernetes cluster. Or simply change the image version uh, in the cluster. And that is the rollback. So that's quite easy. And um, the, the biggest, the biggest and the most complicated problem that I want to mitigate with uh, Portainer is um, developers just letting ops people do it. Uh, I believe that we would be able to uh, do the dev ops at the same time. I believe that it's uh, not that complicated with the right tools. So 
we are able to take care of that and remove the siloed environment and enable that DevOps culture. And here we go. That is the exact uh, magic that happens. And that's uh, quite of a long journey that uh, I'm advising you to take uh, onto DevOps culture. The patterns that we just went over uh, is uh, decoupling CI from CD, is GitOps and DevOps culture. Uh, what do we actually have out of those patterns? Is more opportunity for optimizing our development process. Is that collaborative environment with a good heritage, with all of the features that uh, Git provides us, merging, rebasing, etc. And as the end of that, as the end state of that, it's delivering at really crazy speed from day zero, which you achieve with DevOps culture. Um, I also will follow up with uh, some more materials. Uh, and if you need the presentation link, uh, just let me know. Uh, I'd be happy to provide that. And I think uh, Marisa is sending that out in the chat now. Yeah, I'll follow up with the more materials and uh, let me know if uh, you uh, want to have the presentation on your side as well. And um, what I wanna also mention is that we are um, launching the crazy campaign. You know, we have the Portainer Community Edition, which is completely free and open source. You are able to um, spin that up in a matter of 30 seconds. But also we are starting the Portainer Business Free campaign. Uh, that's uh, our commercial product that we do on the base of Portainer Community Edition. And it has more of a um, enterprise features, more of a more advanced workflows, more advanced role basis policies, uh, etc. Uh, so um, we are launching that campaign. And if you want to um, get a piece of that uh, Portainer business, just let me know. Uh, what we'll do is we're giving away Portainer business uh, for five nodes of your Kubernetes cluster for free. If you got more than five, uh, then uh, that would be a different story. So let me know if uh, you are interested and I'll be happy to help. And the community, if you, if any of this just got your interest, uh, feel free to reach to us on Twitter, on Slack, on Discord, Reddit, LinkedIn, literally anywhere. Uh, we monitor all of these channels and we got you there. Uh, the most active one I'd say is Slack and Discord and Reddit. And if you have any feedback on the product, on the session, uh, on the feature, on the approach, uh, just let us know here and uh, we'd be happy to chat about that as well. Mm, that's it from my side, folks. Uh, let me know if you have uh, any questions. Uh, I would quickly go over them in Q&A. All right, uh, Robert asks, um, uh, Adolfo also wants to answer that question live. So uh, I'll read out the question out loud and let you Adolfo answer that. He is my wing man on the today's presentation. So Robert asks, uh, will the Docker compose to Kubernetes environment create all the needed parts included ingress, persisted volume claims, etc." cetera? Adolfo, wanna step in? Thank you, you're on mute. Okay, meanwhile, I'll just uh, take it over and um, uh, I'll just take it over and uh, respond to that question. Uh, so um, it's, uh, yeah, cool. Uh, it's uh, really a simple thing that Portainer does is uh, we are using a tool called Compose, which is advised by Docker and Kubernetes to be transforming from Docker Compose uh, to uh, Kubernetes manifest. So 
I'm not really sure if that would create the ingress with all the required configuration, uh, but I think Adolfo would be able to answer that uh, when he comes back. So basically relying on that compose tool. Uh, the next one is, uh, we use Portainer Swarm as of now, but I want to move to OpenShift Kubernetes. We are very familiar with Portainer now and not very familiar with OpenShift, I feel that. Um, will uh, Portainer give all of the features that OpenShift provides or not? So uh, as far as I'm concerned, OpenShift is uh, uh, just um, something that really is similar to Kubernetes. So uh, in that sense, uh, Portainer is very agnostic with the distributions and um, if that's Kubernetes alike, then you get all of the Kubernetes features on the OpenShift as well. Uh, but Adolfo might be a better expert in this since I, I recall he did something with OpenShift. Uh, next one is by Rod. How do you manage uh, admin rights on the Kubernetes? So the only selected individuals have the success. So that is actually really simple. Uh, in Portainer, you've got a really advanced uh, role-based uh, role access policies. Uh, so you would be able to uh, configure uh, the teams, the groups, uh, so, um, uh, so the exact teams or groups or exact users uh, have the access to particular resources. Imagine you would want your development team, um, development team alpha, uh, to be able to access only their Kubernetes namespace. So you simply enable that access. We have um, a gradual list of the permissions that you can have as a user. And uh, in that case, you would be doing the either operator read-only or uh, full admin or developer level access. You would be able to um, have a look at the logs, inspect, monitor, uh, Etc. Uh, does Portainer uh, support all of the Kubernetes versions out there um, or only micro Kubernetes? So um, as you've seen, um, um, I was spinning up Kind as the local environment. So it also supports Kind. I use Minikube. I use uh, Azure Kubernetes service. I used uh, the one from the Amazon. I used the one from Google, so all of that is supported. As long as that's Kubernetes alike, um, we are really uh, into supporting that. Uh, Portainer is very generic in that sense of uh, distributions. So must be cool. Uh, all righty. Already, I think um, that uh, um, another question from Tushar. Um, uh, does a portainer support multiple Kubernetes cluster or only one cluster at a time? So um, at, at the moment, um, I had, uh, uh, I think four clusters spent up on my machine. Uh, uh, two kinds and uh, two mini cubes. Uh, so uh, really multiple of environments you can support. Uh, it's not only the Kubernetes clusters, but also Docker environments. Uh, it's also uh, the uh, edge uh, environments. So pretty multi-tenant, I'd say. Hopefully that answers your questions, Tushar. Thank you, Rod. Cool. Would you like me to ask the one on Longhorn? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Robert, hi. Um, so, Portainer is going to work with whatever um, storage technology you have deployed on your Kubernetes environment, um, be that OpenEBS, uh, be that Longhorn. Um, so, it really, it's just going to detect whatever storage you have on your Kubernetes um, and, and, and support it. 
because Portainer is not a infrastructure tool, Portainer is a container management tool. So we don't do, uh, let's say, base installation of containers, um, or, sorry, of Kubernetes clusters. We just manage what is relevant to the containers running on your orchestration environment. I hope that answers your question. Let us know, Rob. And I think, yeah, perfect. He says it's, it is great. Open shift versus Portino, pros and cons. Do you want to shoot that one, Dimpo? Would you like me to go on? Go ahead. Um, okay, so again, open shift is, um, a, in my view, a enabler for Kubernetes clusters, right? I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. If you, I might be, my concept might be, concept might be wrong, but OKD runs on OpenShift, right? Um, so it's a, a platform that enables you to run, amongst other things, Kubernetes clusters, right? Uh, Pertainer is agnostic to what whatever platform you're running on. Uh, Portainer can run on the cloud on bare metal, can run on prem, can run on a public private um, and cloud, hybrid cloud. I mean, we're, we're in a stage above of whatever underlying technology you have running your cluster on. So it's, I really can't say it's comparable in that perspective because I cannot deploy a Kubernetes cluster with Portainer because uh, it's not what I do. I mean, it's not what we do. We will manage the containers running on whatever underlying technology you have for a Kubernetes cluster uh, with Portainer. Um, and it runs on a Raspberry Pi or it runs on a OpenShift environment or on an Azure Cloud, Google. I mean, I mean we've, we've managed to have Portainer run pretty much everywhere that you can imagine, um, even on Alibaba Cloud. So I think there's, that's one of the things that is hard to answer because they're not necessarily the same thing, right? They're not mm -hmm. um, comparable in that perspective. I, I hope this answers your question, Tushan. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool, great. Are there any questions you guys uh, would want us to answer? I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, exactly. The recording of the session will be posted shortly. I think Marisa will uh, give us more details on that one. Marisa, can you step in? Yes, absolutely. The recording will be available on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. You can check back there in a couple hours. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Um, I think that's it from our side. Um, Adolfo, do you have anything to add? Only that it was a great um, uh, webinar, Dimple. Thank you very much. And I know we have clients of ours also um, uh, watching the, the webinar. Uh, Rodrigo is already a client of ours. Thank you for uh, being here, Rodrigo, and watching with his with his director, Eloy Loy. I hope you enjoyed the the webinar. Um, this is a, a, as you saw from a dev perspective. Uh, what we see is the potential that we have, and also um, contributing to the Linux Foundation is is always a great a great experience and an honor. And from from my perspective, so thank you for that. Perfect, perfect. Uh, a few other questions uh, here that I would love to answer. Um, does Portainer uh, support any webhooks? In terms of uh, that GitOps feature that I've showcased uh, today, we also support uh, webhooks uh, and uh, an opposite to polling from the repo. But for monitoring, none of uh, that I'm aware of, even though the monitoring is something that 
will be on our product roadmap. So Portainer will become a tool which uh, you could solely use for doing everything in Kubernetes. Another one is how Portainer is different from GitLab Auto DevOps. I'm not completely into the context of what is GitLab Auto DevOps. Um, so I'd have to go that up. Perhaps you've seen that at all for already? Uh, no, actually, I, I haven't. I'm actually already doing a quick search here. Um, yeah. Well, I, I can say that Portainer is not a Git environment, right? I mean, we we have the capability to connect to a any Git repository and automate deployment of uh, applications or environments environments, if you may, if you consider a stack, um, be that on Docker or on Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do is ensure that there's an automation in terms of deployment of um, environments, be that on any stage that you are in your, um, in your deployment of, from, you know, development to production. So that's what we have in terms of integration. I mean, we had the integration already before. What we now have with this new version is the automation of this integration. So you can automate by polling or even by webhook, uh, webhooks, okay. um, this, this, uh, this integration. And, and the webhooks, basically how it works is that it, if you have a CICD um, process that at some point needs to ensure that there's a deployment to be done in your environment you can connect to pertainer via this webhook and mm -hmm. follow your cycle of of testing and deployment so um this is what it's this is what we do i don't know if this answers the question but this is what we do but we're not a git repository we're not going to do that for you we're going to make sure we can manage the life cycle of your running containers not the let's say the storage of the life cycle of your containers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, perfect. So we, we won't we won't detect your code language. We're not going to do any code qualifying on 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 via or Git or Git implementation. We're just going to automate that deployment. So it's more end of cycle, if you may, um, process. Essentially, what we've seen in uh, the. CI CD pipeline, starting from planning, coding, building, testing, releasing, and that is the that deployment and operating the environment. That's what we do. Perfect, exactly. Okay. I think uh, that is uh, it. Uh, Marisa, would you be so kind uh, to uh, finalize that. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So thank you both so much, Dimko and Adolfo, for your time today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And as I just said, just a quick reminder um, that the recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. So you can watch it again or share it with a friend or whoever you would like. So um, we hope you'll join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Awesome. Happy to be here. Have a great day, folks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.